um, well, I can't help but uh, <laughs> engage in some Christian propaganda right now because I, <laughs> I just uh, I it, I would I'm just gonna lay out I I don't expect to have any um, any takes on this because uh, I'm assuming you're not that familiar with the Eastern Orthodox understanding or like the modern 20th century Orthodox take on what this would be, but really i i think that um when we're talking about the inability to answer the meta question for me i think that's just the product of human finitude i i think that uh, that um it, and if we think about um i did a video on this uh, uh on the t concept of imminence the fact that we're that that we're within you know reality right and we have this this world that we perceive um and we, we're not like god we're not transcendent we can't step back out of our own self and gaze upon ourselves and when you think about imminence it, it's it's um imminence an imminent reality and an imminent conception of reality necessarily has to have some sort of uncertainty some sort of incompleteness in it because from within a perspective it can't be totalized as one consistent whole. And I think that what um, a, a dogmatist would do, and again, I, as you say, it's not necessarily a negative thing, but they would take whatever finitude they have and they try to totalize it and say, this is some sort of consistent, um, certain uh, nugget of truth that we have and we're going to build with it. Um, and yeah, what, that's necessary, right? But I think the Christian understanding would be for one, the truth is God. So the 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 metaphysical miracle, the way to certainty, is literally transcending your finitude through union with this God, entering into infinity itself. That's a the traditional Christian. Um, the uh, it comes from Saint Ath Athanasius, the saying that uh, God became man so that men may may become God or may become like gods. So enter into God Himself. So it's this transcending of the um of the finite uh, into the infinite or from the imminent into the transcendent. Now, this is what I want to ask you. I don't know if you thought about this, but I think the essence of modern philosophy is, is this focus on imminence. Um, it it's the rejection of the transcendent. Um, so um, would, you, would you say that you are committed to a view of imminence? Um, like I, I think Nietzsche is very much imminent. Like uh, Zarathustra, Zarathustra's uh, stuff on uh, loving the earth and stuff, and all we have is the earth and men, and and, and um, also you have uh, Zizek's view of imminence, where all you have is uh, the subject's own horizon, and you just have to deal with, um, uh, well, yeah, all of Zizek's stuff. Um, anyway, so like, what would your view on imminence be? Do you think or or I'm guessing I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna guess your response is gonna be that we you just don't know and you are open to the possibility of there being some sort of transcendent real reality but you just uh you just don't know am i guessing right um i think it yeah i, I definitely go in a skeptical direction um maybe not as just blankly skeptical as you might assume okay um I hope i'm gonna get i'm gonna get these uh words the right way around i hope so <laughs> for, for me i don't know i think i i think naturally if you come from a christian perspective the transcendent like the what that is is going to be very important to you right um if you come from a very material perspective the uh, imminent stuff is going to be really important mm -hmm. to you i'm some i'm somewhere in the middle i don't know because i feel i feel like as human beings um like you said we're finite we are you know fallible we're messy we're all these things right and this is another sense in which i'm anti-philosophical because viewing the meta question or philosophy as such as something that's transcendent you know there's something that we can like try and reach to become like gods or something like this right mm. it does nothing but produce anxiety and just alerts us to the fact that we're so much less than whatever that is right mm. um so i i don't know that's one sense in which i'm still like quite anti-philosophical but for me the imminent is that all important embodied context um it comes back to you know it's not a particularly it's not like a particularly biological view i wouldn't say but it's it's just a recognition of the fact that imminent is you know and i take a very humane view, hume view here you know, like humane view uh, which is that you know it's sensations it's our inclinations it's all those all those messy things about us and that's kind of where for me the philosophical conversation plays out in our actions and inactions. Now, that is not to say that I reject some sort of view of a transcendent 
um, side to things. And I don't think, again, it's a completely negative thing to have a transcendent side to things. They, they're, if, we, if we just went for the imminent stuff, and I feel like Nietzsche really butt up against this for all, in all his work, is if we, if we don't take a view on that, or if we leave that space empty, we are like something human about us like doesn't like that. We would rebel against that. There's something that mm. feels weird about that. So I don't know, it's, it's weird because um, in a sense, and in a sense, we're talking about faith from a philosophical perspective. This, this book has kind of, the work I did in this book, like I said, I, went, I didn't go in with what I wanted to get out of it, but it's has sort of given me a faith, you know? I've, I've, I, I, again, I do, like you, like you rightly predicted, I do take a kind of skeptical view on this. But whatever, whatever that metaphysical truth is, to me, that's, that's, that must be the higher power, right? Mm. Um, whatever the nature of that is, I don't know. The nature of that could be that actually all there is is the material. But I almost, I almost take a faith in whatever that is, because I don't feel like we have another choice that isn't going to cause like <laughs> depression and all these sorts of negative effects we might not want. Um, I just I just question our sort of access to that or the nature of what that is basically. Right. Okay. Okay. Um well I, I want to get into the iconoclast, like the the actual meaning of that term, the iconoclast, a bit more. Um so you say that uh the iconoclast, well, for one, the iconoclast moves in the realm of uncertainty, basically, uh mm -hmm. moves without pres uh, presumptive axioms. And this, I think you say this is really a singular task. Um, it's something that you take on as uh, your own, um, a, a project by yourself. Uh, would you, um, would you, do you agree with that? It's, it's inherently at some level, it has to be a singular task or mm -hmm. is it yeah. possible to be iconoclastic within a community? Is it possible? It, is there even possible to speak of uh, uh, icon an iconoclastic community? No, the, so the I, I, iconoclasm and the iconoclast is definitely it's definitely something of solitude about it. Like it's a so, it's a solitary cognitive task. Because as soon as you, even if it's so much as another person, even as soon as you engage in the messiness of human social interaction, you are you know you're making a you're actually in that in that physical action you're making a philosophical judgment. Um, and you know, I mean, to get more metaphorical about it, like, like the the true philosophical man, like Diogenes or Nietzsche, like then they they are naturally outcast by society mm -hmm. by by nature of the fact that they don't just you know just just accept what we are and get along with it, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and with Nietzsche, um, I think he's a pretty good example of someone who at least had iconoclastic tendencies. And mm -hmm. you you say that um, the fate of the iconoclast is to become lost or truly lost or return to the sub questions, right? So would you say that Nietzsche, um, well, first uh, uh, you could sort of talk about what, what you mean by that, the fate of the iconoclast, why there is this necessity for their sanity, it seems to return to the sub questions. And do you think Nietzsche, Nietzsche seems to be one of those people who maybe got lost in, uh, who truly got lost, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the issue with iconoclasm, at least as far as humans are concerned, is that you never, you end up just destroying and you never really end mm -hmm. up anywhere. As soon as you, if you actually want to end up somewhere, you have to get dogmatic in some way, you have to take something for granted. Um, and again, this is by nature of the fact that we don't have access to the metaphysical truth directly. And we ha still haven't had our metaphysical miracle to reveal this to us. Um, so in the, in the case of Nietzsche, you know, he could be described as a very iconoclastic philosopher. I mean, that has the obvious um connotations from his work on anti-christianity but i feel like my meaning of the word iconoclast could be applied to him um in in his like destructive works that is but one thing that's kind of tragic about nietzsche is you know for whatever reasons like he was a very solitary guy uh lived a very kind of inhuman life which is again kind of lines up with my theory on iconoclasm at least philosophical iconoclasm but it's interesting because even nietzsche in his attempt to kind of reevaluate all of those dogmatic human values ends up in some weirdly dogmatic places, whether it's his assertion of the duality of Apollonian and Dionysian, or whether it's the assertion of the will to power as the kind of mm -hmm. driving mm -hmm. force of everything. Um, he ends up in some very dogmatic places. Um, and I feel like, you know, 
as human beings, again, this brings into this brings back the question of whether we should be aiming to be iconoclastic is that as human beings to actually arrive anywhere, we have to get dogmatic at some point. Yeah. 